All right, we're finally back out here again, back outside, and um, it's kind of a cool morning this morning. Uh, but uh, had a had a question from a younger viewer, and they asked the question, "How do how do you worship God?" And I thought, well, it's pretty easy to answer that. But you know, the more I got to thinking about it, the more I started looking up scriptures. I thought, you know, <laughs> it's almost going to be a sermon. Well, here we are. Uh, it's actually a pretty deep question. How do you worship God? It's kind of windy out here today, so I, I'm, I apologize if there's any sound in the microphone, any kind of wind noise. But, uh, you know, this question of how do you worship God? Uh, you know, again, a lot of people have a very skewed version of this because if I go up to the average person, I say, where do you worship at? They think of a building. Uh and the problem with that is that you see your worship time is limited then to two or three times a week. If you're faithful, you know, of course, uh, that's a problem. That's not how the Lord intended things to be. And I'm going to show you in today's study that, in fact, you're not supposed to go to some place to worship the Lord. Your life is supposed to be worship of the Lord. So let's start out here in John chapter 4. You can turn your King James Bible to John chapter 4. Don't use the other versions. They come from the Vatican. The Vatican kills Christians. The Vatican is not the friend of God. See my other studies on that if you want more information. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye, know, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews." But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now you see in the Old Testament there was a temple that you went to to worship. It wasn't just, you know, I'm just going to worship the Lord wherever or however. No, 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 no. There was a temple. There's no longer a temple except for your body. The Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So there is no more holy temple someplace where we have to go to. And you say, well, that system's been totally done away with. Oh, no, no, actually because in the Millennial Kingdom, there will be another temple. And uh, it's funny because the Antichrist, who the modern day Jews are actually looking forward to receiving as their Messiah, and they will be, a lot of them, and they will be damned to hell, unfortunately for them. But uh, the Antichrist, when he comes, is actually going to build a temple and he's going to sit in the temple showing himself that he is God you can read second Thessalonians chapter 2 about that but uh, right now what we have as Christians we do not have a place where we have to go to to worship the Lord there is no assigned building where you have to go don't let anybody tell you any differently okay and in the time of Jacob's trouble those people that go into that the body of Christ is raptured out before it but the people that go into that time they're not going to have to have a special temple to go to either they're not going to have to travel to Jerusalem, but they will in the Millennial Kingdom. See, there are dispensational differences. Things change. you got to get a hold of that. But right now, Jesus Christ, the book of John, and I'm going to be doing a sermon on this in the future. The book of John is another book that there's a lot of transitional stuff there where Jesus Christ is starting to give hints at the coming church age. All right, You're going to see some of that in the book of John. And so what Jesus is saying here to this woman at the well is, there's going to come a time when you don't have to come to Jerusalem to worship the Father. You're going to be able to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, your worship of God means nothing to God. God doesn't even hear you. We're going to see that in the study. But, uh, so you have to have the Spirit, but you also have to do it God's way, in truth. All right? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Again, we're going to see more of this as we continue in this study. But let's see about this. 3 John, the book of 3 John. Back towards the book of Revelation, the end of your New Testament, there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Go there. 3rd John, it's only one chapter, but we'll start at verse 3 and read to verse 4. It says here, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 
What did Jesus Christ say? They that worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You see it? Here we have John writing this, but it's he's, you know, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is the one who's teaching him this, telling him to say this. And we're going to see here in a minute that this is what God feels. Not just, oh, well, that's just what John's writing. Oh, no, this is what God feels. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. See, it's one thing to have a profession. It's one thing to say, I believe truth. It's another thing entirely to live that truth, to walk in truth. That's another thing entirely. You can have a head knowledge up here and yet not walk in the truth. It doesn't play out in your life. There's a lot of people like that. Next, we're going to go to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. This is one of the most important verses in the entire Bible because this tells you what your purpose is. A lot of people say, what is the meaning of life? Well, uh, you know, what is the point of life? I was reading uh, a brother John Davis uh, sent me a, a book of their different newsletters and everything else, and they ran into a man years ago, this was, but they ran into a man who's 82 years old, and he's still looking for the meaning of life. And there's a lot of people like that, too. Uh, you know, I talked about, you know, talking with a neighbor that's uh, in his 70s, he hasn't found the meaning of life. The meaning of life is right here in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says here, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You know what this is? Right there? This is created for God's pleasure. To have glory be brought to God. When you come out here, you don't look at this and say, this was the result of a random accident billions of years ago, and it's been accident after accident after accident to get to this nice, beautiful scenery that you see here. Uh, that's stupidity, okay? That's, that's the thoughts of a fool, all right? Uh, there aren't really any atheists out there. They're just God-haters is all that they are. But this is not the result of billions of years of mistakes. This was created for God's pleasure and to bring God glory. All right? And guess what? You were created for the same reason. I was created for the same reason. We are created to bring glory and honor to our Creator. Okay? That's the purpose of life. That's the meaning of life. It doesn't matter how hard you work, how much money you save up, how much whatever. It's all pointless and meaningless if you don't know your Creator if you don't have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. All else is in vain. You could live and work and be the, the wealthiest person around and have 500 acres of land and all kinds of everything else and be loved by the community. And if you die, you go to hell and you burn with the guy that was on the street, the drunken bum. Your life is meaningless until you know Jesus Christ, until you know your Creator. Very important. But an interesting tie-in. You say, well, I don't believe in the New Testament. You know, if you're Jewish or something like that, I don't believe in the New Testament. Well, let's see if the New Testament lines up with the Old Testament. Because it does. In many, many ways. Turn back to Psalm 147, verse 11. Huh. Revelation 4, 11. Psalm 147, 11. There's a 4 and 11 in there. Interesting. Don't want to make anything of it, of course, but... Uh, because we know that everything that lines up like that is just coincidence, right? Psalm 147, verse 11. We're going to see a very interesting tie-in here. It says here, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, him in those that hope in his mercy. You say, what's this thing about fear? Well, interestingly, I don't know most Bibles out there, but my Bible, my Cambridge Bible here, if you go right across the page to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I thought that was rather interesting. Uh, three verses that talk really about how your, what your purpose of life is and how you worship God. You have Revelation 4, 
11, Psalm 1, 4, 7, 11. And then you take that, you say, well, there's a 1 and a 7 there that weren't used in Psalm 147, verse 11. Well, then you just take that and you go to Proverbs 1, verse 7. Interesting. The three verses tie together. And there are so many of those, okay? Don't tell me that the chapter and verse numbers are just man created those and they're not really part of the original and they're not really, you know, blah, 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 blah. Hey, God has had his hand on the preservation of this book from the very beginning. And I believe that God used the translators of the King James Bible for seven years. Interesting number. Seven is the number of completion in the Bible. God used the translators of the King James Bible. Took them seven years to make this book right here. And then it was refined a couple of revisions from there because the English language was still fairly new in 1611. It was still not a, a set in stone type of thing. There were some spelling changes and whatever else that were added. But the point is... This book has had God's hand of approval upon it. And when you believe this book, when you read this book, and you come to it with a believing spirit, God will do amazing things for you. And derivatives of this book, other books that are similar to this one. That's why I rip on the, the new versions from the Vatican. The NIV, the NASV, the you know, New King James Version blends some of this and Vatican type readings. Don't even use them. Don't even use them. Use the book that God will bless and use. All right? That's why I make such a, an important distinction there. Uh, we need Bible believers. We don't need Bible rejectors and correctors out there. But let's talk about, now that we've seen some of the preliminary verses here in our study, we're going to look at seven steps to true worship of God. And, of course, you could make more. You could say, well, there's maybe less or whatever. I just picked seven steps. Again, the number seven is a number of God. It's a biblical number. Um, so I'll use some biblical numbers and things. It's not numerology or some kind of thing like that. No, no, no. There are seven spirits of God. There's, you know, look, book of Revelation, you'll see the same thing of seven churches, seven this, seven that, you know, seven judgments, three different sets of seven judgments each. Uh, so there is a system of numbers in the Bible. That's why I chose seven. But uh, we're going to look at seven steps to true worship. And I'm going to be, and there's a whole lot of verses I could go over in this, but we're just going to be hitting a couple verses here. And I'm going to show you how the New Testament and the Old Testament mesh together in many, many ways. What we're going to do is we're going to look at these seven steps of worship, and we're going to see an Old Testament reference, and we're going to see New Testament references. It's very interesting. Okay, what are the seven steps? First of all, you have self-sacrifice. You want to worship God? It's going to take self-sacrifice. Number two, thanksgiving. And by the way, all these things are going to tie together. It's very interesting, this study. We're going to see the scriptures actually use the same words, tying in and intermeshing with each other. Self-sacrifice, thanksgiving. Third, we have singing. Fourth, we have praising the Lord. Fifth, we have love of truth. Sixth, we have confession of sins. And number seven, a changed life. All right? All those are ways that you can truly worship God. So let's begin. Self-sacrifice. Okay? We're going to look at the very first instance of the word worship in your King James Bible. The law of first mention. Go back to Genesis chapter 22. What was the very first time that somebody worshipped God that is mentioned, I should say. The word worship is mentioned. Of course, there was worship before this, but the very first instance of the word worship, we're going to see this thing here about self-sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22, we'll begin at verse 1. It says here, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get Get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Very interesting, because Abraham waited 100 years before he had his son Isaac there. Okay? Very interesting. And it's interesting how a father is supposed to sacrifice his son. Huh. Uh, kind of like God sacrificed his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in the study. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place 
unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. There's the first time in the King James Bible. And come again to you. Okay? Interesting, because again, a little prophetic reference there. Abraham is supposed to sacrifice his son, and he says, we're going to do that, and then I'm going to come again to you. Hmm, interesting. God the Father sacrificed his son, and he's going to come again. The second coming. You know, I get a lot of Jews, and they say, where in the Bible, in the Old Testament, does it say that, you know, the Messiah is going to come a second time? Well, you just read one. The Father sacrifices his son and comes again. Okay? And there's plenty of other ones, too, but another study. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now look at what Abraham says. A little prophetic utterance coming up here. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. What is the prophetic utterance? God will provide himself a lamb. He is the lamb. Okay? The lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's exactly what happened. Verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou any thing unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. All right. You say, what does this have to do with worshiping God? I don't understand. Um, it's called self-sacrifice. Sacrificing things that are very near and dear to you. Uh, question, Christian. How many of you have sacrificed your family to serve Jesus Christ? How many of you have had family members turn against you because of the stands that you take for this book? I have. Many of you have too. Uh, many of you, it's uh, someone as close as a husband or a wife. I've known of both. I know, I've known of husbands that have had their wives turn against them because they take stands for the King James Bible. And I know a lot of wives that have had their husbands turn against them because of their stands for the King James Bible. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid, as the old hymn says? It's rough. It's real rough. You know? And, and why is that happening? You say, why would God do a thing like that? Because He wants you to have personal fellowship with Him. He wants you to feel what He's gone through. Something in it. What's the New Testament tie-in? Romans chapter 12. Back to the New Testament. Romans chapter 12. You say, well, that's just Old Testament. We don't have to sacrifice things today, do we? Yes, we do. Romans chapter 12. If I can get to it here. It's real windy right now. I don't know how much of that you're hearing, but... Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. A living sacrifice? You mean it's never done? Well, till you go to be with the Lord, <laughs> you know. Uh, but till then, you're going to keep sacrificing. But look at the other thing here, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, another sacrifice 
before you is uh, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Sacrificing your time, oftentimes sacrificing your health, sacrificing friends and family, sacrificing a lot of things like that. Yeah. What is that? Worship of the Lord? You're showing God that you're serious enough about your relationship. You know, uh, way back when, when I met my wife, she was the whole way out in Iowa, and I was in Pennsylvania at the time, um, I had to sacrifice a lot of money to go out and get her. Would I have been able to convince her that I loved her if I had said, uh, I think we'll just, you know, maybe we'll get married, but you stay out there and I'll just stay over here and I'm not really going to change my life. I'll just kind of, we'll just say we're married and whatever. That wouldn't be love. I had to do some sacrifices to get out there and get my wife. Well, so it is with the Lord, our relationship to Him. You have to do some sacrifices, some spiritual sacrifices to prove your love for the Lord. Things have to change. You're going to be called upon to give up some things. Yeah. And what about the thing of nonconformity to the world? Yeah, I get real concerned when I start to see Christians uh, keeping up with the latest trends and, and looking like the hip people out there and everything and, and uh, trying to be trendy and stylish and things. I start to kind of, you know, what are you doing? And, uh, I mean, my style has pretty much not changed in quite a few years. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little stubborn. If you've seen that sermon, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, the Bible teaches that a woman's clothes are to be modest. And as far as a man, well, there's supposed to be some modesty there, too. I don't think a man should be, um, you know, dressing in ways that would provoke lust from women. But uh, I really believe that, you know, our clothes should be practical. And uh, I just... I've seen Christians and they get they get to looking real trendy and I just start thinking, you know, kind of dangerous. You're conforming to the world. Don't do that. What about the next one? How about Thanksgiving? Go to the book of Jonah in your Old Testament. The book of Jonah. It's really cold out here right now. Jonah 2, chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. It says here, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, unto thine holy temple. Again, we're dealing with Old Testament here. That they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Notice there, self-sacrifice, thanksgiving. Interesting. The voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what Job is saying while he's down there in the belly of the whale. And then the whale vomits him out. <laughs> the next verse. In verse 10 there. But you see this thing there of a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Hey, when people turn against you and when you have hard times, do you thank the Lord for it? You say, well, um, uh, you're supposed to. You're to be thankful for what the Lord's done for you. Uh, again, another aspect of worship is, are you thankful? Interesting. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. We'll go to the New Testament now and see the tie-in here. Philippians... Chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says here, Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? So you see there, when you pray, there's supposed to be some thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for the food that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for a good day. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me safe today. Thank you for a good night of sleep. Thank you for thanksgiving. Okay? Another aspect of worship. You say, well, I'm only supposed to worship when I'm in, you know, when the doors of the church are open. I'm supposed to worship then. Uh, no, you're supposed to worship all the time. All right? The Bible says also that you're to pray without ceasing. Now, if you're supposed to, in your prayers, have, you know, 
with your supplication and things like that, with your requests, in other words, uh, you're supposed to come with thanksgiving. Pray without ceasing and have thanksgiving. So you should be thanking the Lord for the things that He does throughout the day. You say, how many days a year? 365 days a year. All the time. Very important. How about singing? Let's go back to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Beginning in verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Interesting. And into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Very interesting how many overlaps we see there with the thing of true worship of God. We see praise, we see thanksgiving, we see, you know, singing. We see all these different things. Sacrificing. You see? Very interesting how it all ties together. But uh, how about for a New Testament Christian? Are we supposed to sing? Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, down to verse 19. It says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms. Wait, what did we just read? Psalm 100? Interesting. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks, you know, thanksgiving. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Interesting. Again, we see the thing there of singing. And there's a lot of people that, that actually will sing the psalms and things like that. I know that's a Jewish practice and it's very good practice, very good thing to do. But again, you see the thing there of singing. Hmm. How interesting. And uh, how about praising? We'll go to the next one. Psalm 8. Go back in your Old Testament again to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. We're going to start at verse 3. Read down to verse 9. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the work, works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. You know one of the reasons why there's a lot of atheists out there? because all that they do is spend their time in front of a computer or a television screen or in the city. They don't ever come out here into what God created. You come out here and you actually start to study the intricacy of nature and you realize it's absurd to think all this came about by a random chance. You just look at this and you go, there's no way. There's no way. You know, this, this was created, definitely. I mean, if you can go to an art gallery and look at the paintings and the sculpture and everything else and say, wow, what a bunch of professional, talented artists and yet you come out here, far more detail, far more just beauty. And you can look at this and say, oh, this is just by accident, chaotic accident, billions of years ago <clears throat> gave us all this. You know, but the art came from creators. Uh, the computer with its intricacies and everything else was designed and created by somebody. But nature, nah, no. Nah. You're crazy. You're crazy. But uh, let me ask you a question, Christian. Um, when's the last time you came out in God's creation and actually spent some time studying God's creation? 
When's the last time you looked up close at a flower, a wild flower? When's the last time you came out and you looked at a, you know, went out and looked at some birds? Looked out in an area like this and looked at the trees and the leaves changing color. You know, we saw a, a, the other day, my, my wife and I, we were walking and, and we saw a dragonfly, a big dragonfly, and we were looking at him on a tree and he was just there and out, blue stripes on him and, and just, just the design was incredible. Absolutely intricate. I mean, just to try and design something. I mean, I worked as a, as a wood turner, wood carver for a while and, and I was in a lot of art galleries and, and uh, so I know about painting and, and designing and things. To design stuff like is out here in nature that people just take for granted, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible. And the things out here are living. <laughs> I mean, that's the amazing thing. We're not talking about static art that's just there and whatever else. We're talking about things that are alive and then they die and then they're reborn. And I mean, we're just, it's amazing. And when you come out to a place like this, you know, I don't say nature is our, my temple or something like this. And I come out here to worship God. No, 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 that's, that's not the deal. Uh, but I'll tell you what, when I come out here, I gave praise to the Lord. And you ought to do the same. Get out and see things that God has made and give Him praise, give Him glory for it. You know? It's pretty incredible. And, you know, if you want to see the contrast of this thing, of giving God praise for His creation and praising the Creator, not the creation, the contrast to that is in Romans chapter 1. We're not going to read it, but you can read it. You know, we're not going to read it in the study, but read it in your own time. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25 talk about people that have lost their minds essentially they profess themselves to be wise but they're actually fools atheist uh, evolution types and it says that they worship and serve the creature more than the creator it's another thing a lot of these people do but you can praise God by coming out and looking at his creation considering the things when you consider you know and and I think too. It's, it, it puts things in the right perspective. When you actually come out here and you look at nature and you look at how amazing things are, you look up at the sky and you think to yourself, how small I am. How amazing that God would save just something just so insignificant as me. It's good a good frame of mind to be in. Next we're going to go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. It's always a challenge to turn pages when it's this windy out. Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. Again, we'll see the thing of praise. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. There are a lot of false gods out there in the world. And you as a Christian can really get people worked up when you say well praise the Lord right out in public you know verse 2 I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name do you realize the book that you're holding in your hands if you're holding a King James Bible God of the universe decided he would contact you and he put it in writing that's why being a bible believing christian is the most important thing that you can be why we're held to a standard a written standard i didn't write it you can disagree with me if you can show me verses in here or find verses on your own the lord shows you verses in here that say i'm wrong on different stands that i take you have every right to disagree with me i'm not a cult leader that's why every cult leader in the world wants to get rid of the book. They don't want us all, want all their people having the sword of the Spirit. They want to eliminate the book. Get rid of that nasty old book. Get it out of the way so that they can tell you what to believe. That's why the Pope comes out and he says, Oh, the Bible is a great book. Sacred Scripture. We revere sacred Scripture. But we also have sacred tradition. And where the Bible and sacred tradition contradict well we'll just go with what the pope says or your priest or your bishop or whatever other perverts out there you know that's what they do every cult will turn you away from the book 
you know, Jim Jones. I did a video on Jim Jones years ago, and uh, at one point he said, you don't need this book, and he took the Bible, and he threw it, went out and smacked the floor, and he said, now, did you see anything happen to me? See? There's nothing special about that book. Jim Jones, the trained Jesuit that he was. But you see this thing again there. Praising God, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Thy word is truth. You see how it works? You say, well, I can worship God without the Bible. I see that in a lot of times with these modern professing Christians. You know, We don't really need the Bible. The Bible has errors in it, blah, blah, blah. I'll just worship God my own way. Not acceptable in God's sight. But let's check out Acts chapter 16. We'll go to the New Testament. If you want to see this thing of praising God, a real good form of it being worked out, Acts chapter 16 will show you true praise of the Lord. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Notice somebody who's possessed with a devil is saying that. Okay, be real careful when you see people and they're saying, I believe in Jesus and he's the Most High God. And all this. People that have devils in them can say that. And there's plenty of them on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> believe me. Verse 18, And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans." And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. <laughs> not, not, not only are they beaten, then their feet are put in these stocks, you know, like shackles, you know, the big wooden things that you put down there. Pretty bad. And, uh, Verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas uh, invoked their First Amendment rights and got a lawyer on the phone and said that it was not right for this thing to happen to him, them and their personal civil liberties were violated. Uh, no, that's not what it says. It says, uh, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. Of course, and you know you can read the rest of the story there. But the point is, what happened when they were wronged? They sang praises to God. They gave glory to God. And everybody heard them. And it ended up, you know, the, the jailkeeper got saved. And his family. One of the most famous verses, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. You know, came about as a result of it. Huh. How about that? Um... I have a question for you, a very uh, probing, very um, personal question. You know what it is? If you were put in prison and beaten and mistreated, uh, would you sing praises to God? I have to ask myself that question. Or would you have an attitude? Would you be angry? Would you uh, be tempted to use some profanity? What's your relationship like with the Lord? Um, and there's another part of that question. Do you know hymns? Do you know songs that you can sing to the Lord that if you were put into prison without a hymn book, without your MP3 player, would you be able to sing praises to God? Do you have any hymns memorized? How about that? Kind of rough, isn't it? You know, I heard a story years ago. A friend of mine told me about this. He read a book about a, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And uh, he was tortured terribly. And uh, they put him in this little bamboo cage where he was just 
barely able to, to crouch down there, his knees up, you know, and everything, out in the sun, 120 degrees, Vietnam, just leave him there all day. And uh, they'd give him meat to, to eat, <clears throat> and it had maggots on it. And that's what they had to eat. And uh, they'd do all kinds of horrible stuff, torturing them and beating them and things like this. You know, these soldiers that were prisoners of war, they suffered horribly. And the only thing that kept that guy sane was being able to quote scripture quietly, or else they'd beat him, and uh, sing hymns. And, you know, that's a real conviction to me. Because I say to myself, do I really know the hymns well enough that I could remember them like that? What are you, what are you filling your free time with? Something to think about, brethren. <clears throat> How about love of truth? Another way to worship God. Turn back to your Old Testament, Job chapter 28, verse 28. Another very important scripture. Job 28, 28. Very easy to remember because it's two of the same number. Job chapter 28, 20, verse 28. It says here, And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. You know, there's no such thing as something that the Bible calls evil that is good for you. So when the Bible condemns things that are evil, uh, you do well to get away from them. You don't hold on to it and say, well, you know, I just drink a little bit. You know, all alcohol is bad for you. Well, I just smoke a few cigarettes once in a while. It's bad for you. It's going to give you emphysema, give you cancer. It's expensive, you know. <laughs> I watch a little bit of television. Well, it just, uh, it's all mind control. Making you covet things that you don't have. I mean, that's the whole purpose of television. The commercials are the things that are paying for the TV program. Why would you watch it? You know, fill your mind with all kinds of wicked filth. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, and I mean, we could go on and on and on and on and on. Any sin that's out there is negative. So what do you do? You depart from it. To depart from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, as we read in Proverbs 1, verse 7. See? So I worship the Lord, I worship the Lord, but I'm just going to continue in these sins. Getting ahead of myself here. <clears throat> Next we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 1. Another passage here in the Old Testament. I had a couple I wanted to cover here. Not just one, but Isaiah chapter 1. Verses, uh, let's see, where am I reading here? Isaiah 1, verses 9 through 20. Let's read these verses. If you want love of truth here. Isaiah 1, verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, King James Bible believers for today, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. All right? And then you look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We're getting real close there right now in America where the Sodomites, they're, they're not about equal rights. They're not about, you know, well, just respect us and things. They're anti-Christians. They're, they're God-haters just like the atheists are. That's what's going on. You say, why haven't they totally taken over? Well, because there's a small remnant. A small remnant of King James Bible believers that are still leading people to the Lord. Still pe getting people saved. That's why we haven't totally fallen apart yet. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of God, our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And of course, Sodom and Gomorrah were history at this point in time. But the point is, God in the future calls Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt. Interesting. So God looks at, you know, some places and he says, it's just like Sodom and Gomorrah. He'll actually call them Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight, delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When, he, when ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. 
and when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Kind of like modern day America. Where am I reading to here? Verse 20. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment. Release the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Yeah. You say, wait a second. They were doing the system of worship that God told them to do. And yet God said he hates it. Yeah. You see, God's not interested in worship coming from hypocrites. If you are coming to the Lord and your hands are full of blood and you're all kind, doing all kinds of wickedness and things like this, and of course, you know, Americans are very guilty of their hands being full of blood because, you know, you go down to the average Walmart, you're buying products that were made by Christians, many times Christians in forced labor camps. Oh, but I saved 10 cents on it. You know, I'd rather buy the junk from China than buy the thing from America. And I realize, you know, there's so much now that's been outsourced. It's almost impossible to buy anything from America anymore. It's insane, but it's the result of a long line of sins. People saying, I got to save money. I want to save money. What do you think the Lord thinks of that? We're going to get rich off of the slave labor of other countries. Hey, um, we have our freedom here. Our troops are spreading freedom around the world. No, they're not. They're building the empire. America is the strong arm of the Vatican. Our troops are being used to do the Pope's dirty work. That's what's really going on. I'd be real careful saying, God bless America. I think it's more appropriate to say, God have mercy on America. Please, God, forgive America. And I realize there's nothing we can really do about that. I mean, good night as far as uh, changing the policy and whatnot. I understand. I understand that. But uh, why would you support it? You see? Oh, well, because my friends and family do, and I don't want to make any problems. See, we're back to that. Yeah. Do you fear God or do you fear your family more? But let's continue. First Peter chapter 4. You say, well, uh, it almost sounds like you're trying to judge people. Oh, I'd never think of doing a thing like that. I mean, no, no. I mean, it, you know, I mean, to judge people, I guess I'd have to have a perfect standard and, and uh, you know, believe it. Oh, wait a second. I do. I guess I can judge people then, according to what the Bible says. But where does this judgment begin? 1 Peter chapter 4, read verse 17 and 18. It says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, notice that's interesting there, begins at the house of God, and then he says, at us. What's the house of God? Some stupid building that you're trying to get the mortgage paid off on? No, it's the people. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Yep. You know where judgment needs to begin here in America? Among the uh, professing Christian church. That's one of the reasons why I preach so hard against people having a changed life after salvation. Because I believe that most conversions, most people that profess to be saved are lost and on their way to hell. I was one of them. My life bore no resemblance at all to the people in the Bible back when I was a professing Christian for years and years and years. From the time I was 8 to the time I was 25, I professed to be a Christian. And I lived just as wicked as any lost sinner out there. You know why? Because I was a lost sinner. That's why. Judgment is supposed to begin at the house of God. And by the way, too, you can say, well, wouldn't the house of God just be saved people? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. You see, again, one of the reasons why there's so much trouble is because Christians compromise so much with the world. 
they do so many things that God's like, what are you doing? This is wrong. What are you, what, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> then, you know, I've done my share of things. I'm not, I'm not pointing my finger and saying, I'm perfect. You're bad. You're evil and things like that. You're the one that needs to clean up. And I don't, I've had to clean up all kinds of things. That's the Christian life, a life of repentance, a life of, of, you know, sanctification. That's what it is. You don't do those things to get saved. Hello, you know, uh, listen up for the eight millionth time for the people out there that are saying I preach work salvation. <laughs> you don't do works to get saved. You do works meet for repentance. But let's continue. John 14, verse 6. We're not going to turn there for sake of time. I see my battery starting to get a little low. Jesus saith unto them. Well, actually, we got to turn there because we're going to be going to another verse. So turn to John chapter 14. Thought I had that thing charged. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, what do we read at the beginning? They that worship the Father must worship him in spirit, Holy Spirit, and in truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting. Jump down to verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The Spirit of Jesus Christ there. If you want to look up a verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, talks about the, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. Yeah, if you don't have the Holy Spirit of truth, you're not saved. It's just as simple as that. Next, we're going to go to Confession of Sins. Psalm 51. You can turn to Psalm 51. Now, we're not going to read it because I'm out here and I forgot to bring my backup battery thing. And I see my battery is getting really low. But if you want to read, if you really mess up in your sin and you, you, you know, look at pornography, you get drunk, you, you, know, you do some kind of stupid thing and you're saved, you know it's wrong, whatever else, Psalm 51 is real good to read. That's the right kind of attitude that you should have towards your sin. Uh... You know, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Like I said, we can't read it right now for sake of time. But you see the, th the whole thing there going down through. Um, look at verse 11. It says, cast, not away from thy, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now that's not for you as a Christian, because in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 4, it says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you're not going to have the Holy Spirit taken from you. But they could in the Old Testament. That did happen. Not the same setup. See, dispensational difference. All right. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 7 through 10. Turning back to your New Testament. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 10 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You are cleansed from sin when you get saved. But look at this, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. See we truth again there? Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Watch out for people telling you you don't have to confess your sins after you get saved. Look out for that. You say, well, that's back in 1 John, and there's some dispensational stuff. Some of the hyper-dispensationalists will try to get you there. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 27 through 32. The Bible says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. 
Look at this, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Yes, you are supposed to judge yourself according to this book. You look at the Bible and you say, oh boy, I messed up there and things. You get in, you know, you want to restore that fellowship with the Lord. When you come, the purpose of communion among the body of Christ, the purpose of breaking the bread and, you know, the verses preceding there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the purpose of that is for self-examination. When you say to yourself, hey, I'm not a real, I'm not a, I'm not a false convert, excuse me, I'm not a false convert, uh, I'm eating and drinking this bread, you know, the, eating the bread, drinking the, the wine there, um, I'm eating and drinking it worthily because, why? Because I'm saved. I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand that I put my faith in Jesus Christ and, you know, like that. But you get somebody who's a false convert that just is kind of flippant about their sin. They don't really care, but they don't really think about it. That's a problem. Okay? And if you're a Christian and you are just kind of not really overly concerned about your sin, um, you're going to be judged. You're going to be chastened of the Lord. So, uh, I'm going to stop it here. I'm going to finish the rest of this video back at the ministry headquarters back in studio. Um... Uh, our little video studio area there because the battery is like on the last line of being charged there. Uh, it's super duper windy out here. I hope that the audio even has turned out. Um, I don't normally do this. I don't like to try to get the whole thing done, but I still got a couple points and I don't like rushing like this. So um, I have some work I need to get done today out here and uh, I'm going to do that and I'm going to finish the video back at the ministry headquarters. So be back with you here in just a couple of minutes. All right, we are back here in the studio. I apologize for my battery dying out on me. Uh, the beauty of working with technology, I guess, but uh, oh well. Well, let's continue here. One more point to go in this study, and that is the seventh form of worship of God, the seventh step, so to speak, in worshiping God is a changed life. Let's read about this. Psalm 66. Turn in your King James Bible to Psalm 66. We're going to start at uh, verse 13 when you get there. Psalm 66, verse 13. It says here, I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows which my lips have uttered, and my mouth hath spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats. Selah. Again, you have Old Testament here. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. Now look at verse 18, another very important verse. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Remember, we read that over there in Isaiah chapter 1. But verily God hath heard me, he hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Okay? Um, when you have somebody that's living in perpetual sin, and they're not, they know it's wrong, I'm talking about a saved person. They know it's wrong. They're not confessing it. They're not forsaking it. They're just continuing in it and continuing in it and continuing in it. If that person gets to a place where they have uh, quenched the Holy Spirit of God, which you can do as a Christian, you can get to a point where uh, you're just not really listening to the Lord very much. Um, and you kind of just put up with the chastening that comes from that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read that earlier, it actually talks about, you know, that many people actually sleep. <laughs> there are actually people that, that God will kill early, take home early, be, you know, save people, again, I'm talking about, because they don't, they don't forsake that sin. Uh, my point being, when you get truly saved, you are God's property, and He expects a changed life. And the Bible says right here in our text, Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You say, well, we're in the New Testament, we're under grace, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm aware of all that nice stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. But you know God still hates sin. 
he still hates it. And don't tell me that you can be right with God and just go on living in perpetual sin. Um, and I'm talking about not knowing sin, so knowing it's wrong, and you just keep doing it anyhow, okay? I understand everybody sins, all of sin, all have come short of the glory of God. I understand that. I understand that, you know, you can start to throw in anything like overeating, oversleeping, you know, a little bit of pride or whatever else. You can really get into the nitty-gritty with sin, okay? But I'm talking about something that you know is wrong, and you just continue in it. If you do that, you're not going to have a very good relationship with the Lord. God does expect a changed life. Next, go to John chapter 5. For the people out there that are screaming, but it's Old Testament, it's Old Testament. Let's look about that. John chapter 5, verse 14. I'll show you some more verses in the Old Testament. <laughs> Because the Testament, the New Testament, starts with the death of the testator. So technically, these are in the Old Testament, in a collection of books called New Testament, but technically Old Testament. John chapter 5 and verse 14 says, Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, the man that he had healed, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Okay, um, is that true for a child of God? Yes. Yes, it is. Because you see, now, as you know, when you were a lost person, you really didn't have much help. You really couldn't depart from evil. You couldn't depart from sin. But now that you're saved, now you have God's Holy Spirit within you to convict you of sin, number one. Number two, to help you get away from that sin. So if you, when you, if you, when you sin as a Christian, as a child of God, you're in a different relationship now with the Lord. Now he has uh, not only the right, but the responsibility to chasten you, to punish you. All right. Next go to John 8, verses 10 through 11. We're going to see a very similar thing here. John 8, verses 10 through 11. This is the woman taken in, in adultery. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see it there again. Hmm. See, but that's still, you see it, Old Testament. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And you can read the whole chapter there, chapter 6. It talks about this thing of you're not supposed to continue in sin. You're supposed to sin no more. Do your very best to fight against sin on a daily basis. It's a life of repentance. The Christian life is a life of repentance. Why? All sin is negative. Every sin out there is negative. So the Lord gives you the knowledge and he also gives you the power to depart from sin. To get away from sin. You know? I mean, this this whole thing right now, this whole big debate that goes on, this this lordship salvation debate and going back and forth and easy believism and, and what, a, what is repentance, what's the meaning of repentance, the whole thing is centered around sin. That's the whole thing. How much do you put up with sin? If you're easy believism, you just kind of say, well, any sin, and you get all philosophical and you say, but somebody could technically do such and such sins and still be saved and all this other stuff. It's all about taking a lighter attitude towards sin. And I just don't think we're supposed to do that as Christians. And you know, you say, what about Romans chapter 7? Talk, Paul talks about doing the things that he shouldn't do and all that stuff. You know, I, I was thinking about that this week and I thought, what are the sins that Paul was struggling with? I mean, when you read the New Testament, was there any stories about Paul, you know, well, yeah, he kind of 
had a fornication problem and you know he, he was going to some things and looking at some stuff he shouldn't have been and I saw him drunk the one time you know what I think Paul's things that he struggled with were I mean, I'm just like trying to think in my mind, you know, he talks about at one point, you know, having to boast and speak foolishly and things because people are, are questioning his ability to be an apostle, you know, one of the, you know, the 12th apostle. Um, I think Paul probably struggled with probably some covetousness, perhaps. Um, you know, uh, I know definitely he struggled with depression. Uh, he talked about, you know, uh, continual sorrow in his heart and and how that he's going to try to change because when he comes he's he's supposed to make them glad and, and he there he is he's struggling with all this sorrow um, there might have been some pride things that he struggled but Romans chapter 7 doesn't mean that Paul was struggling with some kind of porn addiction or or alcohol or watching TV or something like that Paul lived a very very clean life so for Christians to use Romans chapter 7 to justify sins that they know are wrong and to say, I believe so-and-so is saved because after all, Paul struggled with sin. Uh, you're quite wicked. Okay? And I'll tell you what, a lot of these guys that, that do all the talk about, you know, we're against Lordship Salvation, and they say, uh, Brian Denlinger is, is backloading works into salvation, and he's teaching Lordship Salvation, all this other stuff. You won't hear them talk much about their past lost life. They're not really grieved by their past lost life. And you say, well, we're supposed to forget those things that are behind. Yeah, but, you know, Paul talked about, you know, things that he did before he was saved. You know, I mean, you don't just dwell on that stuff. I understand that. But, uh, you know, you can use that, those past problems that you had to witness to people and say, yeah, you know, I used to do those same things back before I got saved. Things changed. I mean, really, if, if there's no new life that comes, there's no changed life that comes from salvation, what really do you have to offer anybody? You say eternal life. Well, that, that's great and everything. I mean, don't get me wrong. Eternal life is great. But uh, what about those people that are struggling with sin? You know, the people that uh, actually want a changed life? You know, those of us that have been out there and messed up in sin and things and, and have pretty much ruined our lives and been totally broken when we came to God for salvation. You know, the idea of a changed life is a wonderful thing. And you say, well, why are you making such a point of this? Well, because a changed life is another form of worship. It's what I would call the seventh step of worship. Uh, and very, very important. I mean, think of it this way. Let's say you're married, and a lot of you are, of course, and your husband, wife, whichever of the two you are, they come home and they say, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you know, you're like, hey, where were you at? And they say, well, you know, I was, I was out at the bar and, yeah, and I was at this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just use my wife as an example, you know, to, to make the analogy here. She's away. She comes back. She says, ah, I was out at a bar and, and uh, yeah, you know, I kind of spent the night at some guy's house and well, there was a couple other guys there too. But, you know, what's the big deal once you, you know, are with one, we'll just keep it going. And, and uh, yeah, you know, we did some drugs and, and did some alcohol and everything, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, we did whatever else. And, and uh, but I love you. <laughs> um, and I, I here's some flowers for you. Here's some nice, here's a, a cake I baked for you. Would I take her seriously? Of course not. If you're a woman out there and your husband came home and did all those things and stuff and, and you know, doing all this horrible stuff, and then he says, but I love you. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Well, if you're smart enough to figure out that fake character, don't you think God's a little bit smarter? And he can see when somebody fake worships him. You know, you get these modern charismaniac people and things, and, uh, you know, you see them in, the, in their churches, and they've got their hands up, you know, oh, 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 you know, listening to the rock music and stuff, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard stories. I'm, I can't even repeat stories of stuff that goes on in these modern Babel buildings. It, it's so over-the-top wicked. I mean, just vexing. And they're calling that praise of the Lord. 
There's no changed life. There's no, let me get my list here. There's no self-sacrifice. There's no thanksgiving. They're not thankful for what they have. They want more. They're greedy. Their singing is fleshly based. You know, and I didn't make the point earlier, but uh, there in Ephesians chapter 5, it says singing and making melody in your heart, not rhythm. Uh, praising, their praise is, is fleshly. Again, it's, it's man-centered. It's not really truly praising the Lord. It's not, they have no appreciation for what God's made out in nature or anything else. Uh, love of the truth, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, in these modern Babel buildings, they don't love the truth. If they did, they wouldn't even be going there. You know, it's kind of counterproductive there. How about confession of sins? Who are you to judge me? You know, you get that from those people. And a changed life? Of course not. Don't be silly. Um, brethren, worshiping God is the purpose for us being here. And I'll tell you what, when you are worshiping the Lord and you are living for the Lord and things, things like witnessing and, and being bold for the Lord, that stuff's going to come naturally. Why? Because it's your lifestyle. It, it's just out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You, you just, it just comes naturally because it's, it's who you are. You know? So, that's going to be it for this study. Um, very good question. Really enjoyed putting this one together and uh, very convicting. Uh, you know, all of us need to examine ourselves and, you know, just really say, are there some things I need to get cleaned up with the Lord? How, how, how many hymns do I really know? You know, could I, if I was put in prison in stocks, um, is my relationship right with the Lord to the point where it would cause me to sing praises to Him? You know, there's a lot of people and they, they say, you know, well, things could get real bad in America. And I, and I understand, they, understand they could. You know, I mean, we're like right on the brink of war with China and Russia and I mean, all this other really fun stuff. And it's just like it could get real bad before the Lord takes us out of here. I've never preached that the rapture is a escapism and, and we're just going to get out before anything bad happens. I mean, we get out before the Antichrist is revealed. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, t definitely teaches that. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. The he who now letteth is the body of Christ. Um, again, I've talked about that in other studies. But the whole fact of the matter is it it doesn't really matter what happens in the future. Uh, we can praise the Lord the whole way through that. We can worship God. And I dare say, if things did break down, and you got to that point, that Acts 16 kind of a point where you're, you've been beaten falsely, and you've been thrown in prison, and everything else, I think that you would experience a level of spiritual connection and fellowship with the Lord there, uh, singing praises to Him after having something like that happening to you. Uh, wow, I think it'd be really incredible. Um, I, I'm not saying we should want that. I'm not saying we should desire that. Uh, I desire to live at peace. Um, I desire to, to, you know, live in a country where I can continue to preach the gospel. I don't desire to have our rights and freedoms taken from us. Not at all. But no matter what happens as a Christian, uh, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. And of course... We have all of eternity to look forward to. So whatever little sufferings we get to do down here are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us through Jesus Christ. Uh, just really something to think about. Um, make sure that your worship of the Lord is not centered around some dead building, some place that God never told anybody to build. Um, make sure that your worship is seven days a week. I highly recommend that. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.